national importance and this one continues with a few subsidy probe. Yes, you might have seen some headlines here and there which we did take a look at. But uh, continue with that this morning. We're well, joined by Captain Manuel Hanacho, who is a former Minister of in Internal Affairs. Thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, it's amazing some of these headlines when we see them and... Uh, of course, investigation has to go on, and Nigerians can only wait for the outcome. But it looks as though the more they wait, <laughs> the more they hear some more stories unfold. And now we hear this Aigimokide panel that additional $10 million, $10 million actually, was given to this panel, this Farouk Lawan committee. And boy, any more surprises? Who knows how this will turn out? But from what you've seen, you've been, of course, following these matters. Are you in any way, what are your thoughts first on it? Well, I mean, um, you, I've been on this program uh, in times past and we talked about this issue. And basically what was said was that uh, it's a good thing for the pro panels to be established so that if anybody actually tried to rip the government off, we would indeed uh, catch up with that person and the force of law would be brought to be on them. But having said that, of course, we also said that it was very important that a thorough job be done so that uh, innocents are not ensnared and uh, you know, the reputation and standing of people are not unnecessarily besmirched. You saw what happened with the uh, House of Reps uh, panel, you know, where we were raising the alarm to say that things are not right. You know, uh, the time that was given to them, it seemed that they were really being pressured to uh, deliver very quickly. And when they turned in their report, we really were very surprised at the uh, the way they had done it, because if you ask somebody to uh, bring in materials to validate some assumptions that you have, if you have any subsequent uh, uh, problems, you would call that person to say, well, look, I've tried to analyze the data that you have given to me, and uh, can you please uh, throw some light on some of these issues? But if you don't do that, and suddenly you go and say, well, these and these, these people are guilty, then you make yourself the judge, you make yourself the jury, and you make yourself the executioner. So um, from that point of view, what was done then was absolutely incorrect. Unfortunately, um, the uh, Aig Mukwede panel has actually turned in its report. And it seems to me that they've done exactly the self same thing. They asked people in writing to provide their evidence of uh, their importations. And people send those uh, reports in. And people were waiting for them to call them back in to say, well, we've had difficulties with some of these things. We didn't. And the next thing we saw, names appeared in the newspapers everywhere to say, well, these guys have received uh, such and such an amount. But we've been analyzing some of these things, and we really see that some of them are absolutely wrong. And we're pointing these things out to them. But we really are saying that all of these uh, problems could have been avoided had they been a little bit more diligent in terms of the way that they have done their job. I think uh, Nigerians will be, uh, I think it will be hard for Nigerians to even believe because uh, they saw some of these uh, happen on live TV, specifically speaking about the Farouk Lawan uh, committee and uh, people came before the committees. So having dropped those documents, now we're trying to see what Aigi Mokode and Farouk Lawan did wrong uh, from your, your own perspective. Didn't they call these same marketers again for some clarifications, or did they just leave the documents, and after that, they came up with a report? Well, I mean, you saw what happened. I mean, everybody watched it on live television. People were asked questions. Some people were absolutely given a rough time uh, on television. But at the end of the day, um, the interaction that we expected to uh, take place between the interrogators and the people who have been interrogated didn't happen. In fact, we had situations where people who were not even invited to the panel were adjudged to have uh, been guilty of uh, taking a uh, unmerited subsidy. We had situations of people who did not trade in a uh, uh, PMS specifically, because when we're talking about subsidies, we're talking only about subsidies on PMS. And those people were adjudged to have uh, taken money, and even when it was pointed out to them that this was not the case, all they needed to do was to verify whether or not those people actually traded in the products, and that matter would have been solved. So there were lots and lots of problems in the air. But we just got this impression that these guys were in a hurry, absolutely, to deliver something, anything. It didn't matter if people's reputations were ruined in the process. Uh, they didn't really care about that. But unfortunately, all the um, problems that we talked about in the beginning are beginning to unfold. The Nigerian masses are entitled to know who's stolen their money. 
but it must be done in a way that is fair and equitable to everyone concerned. Um, the situation that we have on ground is putting marketers in a very difficult position. A lot of marketers are owed huge amounts of money by their system, and this money is not being paid to them at all. The banks are refusing to advance credit to them, and um, their livelihoods are under threat. And if this continues for any length of time, you would hear that marketers are shedding jobs, and uh, really because people didn't do their job well. So are we saying then, I mean, looking, taking a look at everything, we know for sure now that the subsidy report is not going to be taken wholesale to the courts. Is it not also possible because, I mean, yes, there have been indictments made in that report, observations mostly also made as well, questions asked or questions raised, but isn't that left for the, you know, the judiciary now to take on the job from there and truly clear those who, who need to be cleared uh, and, and, you know, prosecute those who truly need to be prosecuted. Do you still have faith that that last part might actually see those who are truly not guilty through? Well, that's right. I mean, um, what we are complaining about is the way this whole thing was done. If you remember when the Attorney General came out and made a statement to say that this was really not an indictment, it was something that the, it was worked in progress, mm -hmm. which he and uh, the security agencies were going to work on. Mm -hmm. Everybody jumped on his back, and they said he shouldn't have said that. The requirements of fairness and equity require that we must look carefully at what these people had done. It's not the job of the uh, members of the House of Reps to assign to themselves the role of uh, or the responsibilities of the Attorney General. They have done their bit. All they would have done is that we suspect that such and such had happened. Not to say that these guys are guilty. But isn't that what they did in their report? Didn't no, they? but that's not what they did because they said these guys had taken the money. They have no proof that this had happened. If you bring somebody who's not guilty, if I say I'm accusing this man of something, if there is a likelihood that uh, somebody has drawn subsidies that they haven't merited, it is different from you saying categorically that these guys have stolen money. I mean, you look at the, uh, uh, the way people were being described in the newspapers oil thieves, subsidy thieves, and when people talk, they look at them and say, ah, well, you see, that's how he's been living all the time. We didn't know that he was uh, stealing money from the government. It's really not a very nice thing at all. But and we really must learn to do things correctly in this country. But that wasn't from the Farouk Lawan committee, because, I mean, we, like, as you rightly pointed out, most people watch the interrogation live on television, mm -hmm. and some of the replies are being given by some people you know, immediately put a question on the integrity and the genuineness of their business, as it were. Didn't you have your own, you know, reservations as well? About what? I mean, I uh, really um, stuck to my own situation. We can only speak for our company. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to speak for any other person. Mm -hmm. And we said it from day one that really all the information that we uh, required to uh, deliver to the um, committee, we delivered it. Mm -hmm. And we waited for them actually to come back to us to say, ah, we need clarification on some of these issues. And next, you know, they said, well, your company has drawn 13 point something billion. And we're sitting down there thinking that since 19, uh, 2008, about 2009, my company, because of the downturn of business in 2008, we took a hit. And we were down by about five billion. And we've been struggling since that time to try and pay it back. And suddenly somebody says that you've taken 13 billion. If you owed five billion and you hit a windfall of 13 billion, what would you do? The first thing that you would do would be to pay it off. But if you didn't pay it off and you still have that in your books, then that tells you that there's something wrong. Well, we asked them to say, this allegation that you have made about people drawing 13 point something billion, can you let us see how you arrived at it. And you know, you are ducking and diving all the time. They never showed us how does, how does it really work uh, as a marketer when you import cargo under the uh, petroleum subsidy uh, fund? What kind of uh, documents do you submit to show evidence that you have actually loaded that cargo, you have done everything with that money that was given to you as a marketer? It is the most rigorous process that we go through. You know, uh, first and foremost, you have to uh, have permission from the PPPRA to import this cargo. And once you have this permission, then you take it and you go to the banks and say, well, I've been given permission by the PPPRA to import this cargo. And you do a projection for them. And if they're satisfied with it, they lend you the money. So to start with, there is absolutely no way you can import cargo without borrowing because of the huge amounts involved. 
to land the 30,000 parcel of cargo, for instance, you need about five and a half billion. So if you see a person who doesn't go to the bank to import that kind of cargo, then you really have to look at his source of income. We all go to the bank. So all these issues about whether or not people imported can easily be ascertained by reference even only to the bank. But going beyond the, beyond the banks, the PPPRA has a list of 38 items that you must supply. 38. 38 absolute documentation. Even if it's one cargo? Even if it's one cargo, even if it's one ton that comes through, I could read it out for you because people just don't understand what goes on here. 38, 38 items that you have to uh, supply just to prove that you actually imported that cargo. You have the PPPRA permit. You have the evidence from the bank showing uh, the amount of the transaction. You have letter of credit from the banks. You have letter of affirmation of discharge. Have final invoice. You have all of those things. So all of this. Uh, yes, were, were all they, of these thirty-eight items. The, items. Yes. Did you submit them to the Farouk Lawan Committee as well as the Aigimokwede Committee? Did they ask for this? They didn't documents? ask for all of these things because really, if you want the documentation that we that covers all of our importation over the years, we'd need several trucks to be able to bring them down. So we bring the basic things that you require, and we bring it before them. But again, let me t tell you about these 38 documents. Once you have brought these 38 documents, it now has to be validated by about five people. Three officials from the PPPRA, one official from your own company, and one official from the auditor's company. They would individually validate all of these things. The other point that I'd like to make is, once you have submitted these documents, it doesn't mean that automatically you receive the refund that is due to you. You apply to the PPPRA with all of these documents and they go through the process of evaluating them again. And if they are then satisfied with it, the money is not given to you automatically. They recommend to the Minister of Finance, then to the DMO, that's the Debt Management Office, and eventually to the CBN. It goes through a very rigorous uh, process indeed. So yeah. when people uh, make accusations, I really think that they have to be very careful before they start banding accusations and giving people's names. Well, it's easy for you to spoil somebody's name, but not so easy for you to restore that person's uh, name once that is done. But in spite of all of these um, requirements that marketers are required to go through, I mean, yes, they may be spelt out, but of course you also do know that from the responses that some people who appeared before that panel gave, it left much to be desired. I mean, he left a lot of people asking, how could this be happening? There mm. were basic questions that were put forward to them, and if all of them comply with all of this, mm -hmm. they could have given straight answers, but mm. some of them couldn't even come forward with any answer. So if some people latched onto that and came up with that, it would be unfortunate, really, but you also will agree that these circumstances, I mean, these requirements can be circumvented. Well, let me just tell you again, uh, like I said when we started this program, I'm speaking only for my company. Not even for yeah. an association, I mean, because... I'm not, I'm not really representing an association as do, I'm speaking this Do you belong to any? Well, uh, my company belongs to DAPMA, which is uh, the Depot uh, Owners Association. I'm not speaking for... I'm speaking specifically for my uh, organization. Because I don't really know... You could be in an organization with people, but you could never vouch for what they do. Of course, uh, most of the people, they are absolutely responsible people. But really, in the circumstances, it is as safe for you only to talk about yourself. Mm. You don't think that even associations could help in this, I mean, in this particular scenario? Because someone would say, how is it that we budgeted 250 billion now for subsidies for just PMS? Oh, yeah, maybe just for just PMS. Mm. And then we ended up spending over two trillion now. And it seems that, you know, people are not willing to own up. Don't you think that associations have a lot of role here to play to be able to clear their members' names? Well, it depends on the assumptions that you make uh, when you talk about the amount uh, budgeted and the disparity between the budget and mm -hmm. what is actually um, realized. It depends on the assumptions that you make. If you make assum wrong assumptions with respect to, say, the uh, daily consumption, then you are going to have that big disparity. So the question that you really need to answer is... Um, what the assumptions with regards to consumption right from day one. Um, so this is the issue. Since, but I'd like to say that uh, since the um, management at PPPRA changed and Mr. Stanley came on board, they have a very rigorous uh, regime that they have been implementing. 
And if you really wanted to get a very good sample as to what the actual consumption was, you take a snapshot in time between when he came on board and now, and you have a look at their data. And I think that you really will get a very good idea as to how much we actually consume, consume on a daily basis and what the um, uh, refunds or subsidy for that period might be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting you say that because, I mean, they did this in comparison with a host of other periods and in comparison with, say, 2010, for instance, and mm -hmm. even 2009, the mm -hmm. disparity was just huge, humongous, as it were. Mm -hmm. They tried to blame that on the fact that people would have imported cars, uh, cost of fuel would also have gone up. There are so many uh, times. There are so many. But even then, it still did not quite account for the, di the difference, you know, in terms of what we paid for in 2010 or is it 2009. And what was paid for in 2011, from what we understand, a host of marketers are, all, are still being owed, and at least from the last figure that we heard from the CBN, mm. given an authoritative figure as of December mm. 2011, they said they had paid 1.7 trillion naira. I mean, how do we begin to explain that? Well, one of the things that I don't, I don't do is to play around with the figures. I play around with reality. You know, I borrow money uh, from the banks to import cargoes and we we'll sell it. Mm -hmm. We uh, import the cargoes and we we'll land it at a certain price and the government says that we have to sell it at a discount. And once we sell it at that discount, then we expect it to be reimbursed the difference. You have just made a comment that a lot of people are owed money. I have been owed money since last year. I am owed more than 10 billion. I am owed more than 10 billion. The interest element alone in terms of the monies that I am, I am owed is more than 400 a million and is counting on a daily basis. And now we're faced with a situation where you are skeptical and sometimes the government is skeptical. Say, so why? No, this cannot be. We're going to stop it. That's what the um, Honorable Minister of Finance said. Mm -hmm. And then she uh, put a hold on it. Mm -hmm. In the interval, what do you think is happening to the interest clock? Is it stopping? It's growing all the time. And when we then put in additional claims to them to say, well, the interest clock is uh, moving mm -hmm. and you have to pay us this, you don't hear anything. Mm -hmm. but, but when we talk about uh, making claims for exchange rate, uh, rate fluctuations, mm -hmm. risks that are not captured on the PPPRA template, mm -hmm. nobody says anything. But these costs have to fall somewhere. We cannot sit down there and be made scapegoats off. And we're sitting down there importing these things and we have an arrangement that uh, this payments will be made to us in 45 days. We're going to 171 days and we're not receiving any payments from anyone. Don't you think that that is where the association should come in? What exactly is their role, as it were? Well, I mean, um, I used to be um, an official of the association before I became minister, but since I came back, of course, I've not reassumed uh, that position. Mm -hmm. uh, really, I do agree with you that the, um, the association really have a very key role to articulate these uh, issues and uh, elaborate on this problem. Not just elaborate on the problem. They must elaborate on it also, so that people understand. But exactly also the helping the government to weed out those people who truly are trying to give their associations a bad name. I agree with you. Absolutely. They do have a role to play. And I, uh, I hope that they are watching what we're saying here and that they can indeed uh, find a way to look amongst their members and look at people who are absolutely bending the rules and giving other people a because bad name. Because the picture I, I get here now, I'm trying to see if we can actually project if truly if everyone has been owed and we have accumulated interest on a daily basis, mm -hmm. it comes to a time where they can't even uh, import products anymore. Well, we, we cannot. Let and me just take at the end of the day, we just might be seeing the cues back again. I, let me just take it away from you. There are lots and lots of uh, marketers who are not able to import, including myself. I haven't stemmed any cargo for the past one month. And the reason I haven't done it is that the banks who sponsor our importation looked at the books and said, well, you are down by 10 billion. We cannot advance you any more money. And I don't blame them. And we write letters and uh, try and uh, sensitize the uh, Ministry of Finance and the PPPRA that this is happening, but nothing is being done. But let me tell you, yes, of course, a lot of people are not importing. But the intervention, we have to talk about the intervention of a, uh, the NNPC in all of this. The NNPC continues to intervene in the market in a way that absolutely undermines uh, private uh, sector marketers. How? For instance, the NNPC is injecting cargoes into the market right now. And these are cargoes that they have gotten from their swap deals. And so we are in a situation where we are sidelined because we are owed money. And then NPCs are bringing cargoes and injecting at what cost? No one really knows the cost. But at the end of the day, it's you and me who bear the real cost. What kind because of swap deals are we talking about? Is swap deals, they take, out a, um, they take out crude and they bring back a refined products. 
And what we really want uh, for NNPC to continue to uh, intervene, to we contract. create so, problems so, so, in the market sorry all the to time. Does that help us as a nation? Well, yeah, because if we can't even quantify or really put an amount on all of this, that, that, that's the problem. You see, it's people? a transparency issue, isn't it? Because if they are engaging in swap deals and you do not know the basis upon which those swap deals are being um, agreed, if there are 20 or 30 vessels standing offshore all the time and you do not know what the demolition element on those uh, vessels are, if you are a government official, and you do not have to bear the cost of keeping those ships there. So you could keep them for 100 years and nobody cares. But if you were a private sector man, you want to get that ship offloaded in three days. But now we have a situation where the private sector operators and marketers have been sidelined. And our businesses are absolutely languishing. And the NMPC is injecting cargoes into the market. At what cost? People really are entitled to know. So uh, what, what should they be doing, ideally, NMPC? Yeah, I, they, Ideally, I mean, I, I don't really see that NMPC should be in competition with their private sector operators in terms of doing things that we can do cheaper and better. For even, instance, even though they have a JV agreement, JV with who? You know, you know that JV would be that with who? And what is the substance of this? It's, 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 it's hard to believe because mm -hmm. if the NMPC can sell, for instance, kerosene that we're not talking about uh, PMS now is selling four to one now. Uh, to depot owners and maybe some other people, like the kerosene for 41 naira per liter. Mm. And at the end of the day, marketers and uh, depot owners are now selling that same product they get at 41 naira, uh, 125 naira. Meaning, if NNPC is not in the market, then everyone will be dead. No, no, no. no. Well, there, are, there are certain things that you do not see in that 41 uh, uh, naira that NNPC is selling. Why is NNPC selling at 41 naira? What is the actual cost to the economy of that product that is being sold at 41 naira? You assume that the product costs 41 naira. No, that's not what it costs. It costs maybe 141 naira. So they have discounted the 100 naira, which you and I have to pay ultimately. And they have sold it at 41 naira. The other thing, of course, is that you are seeing the amount that the NNPC sells it for and the amount that people sell it uh, um, X depot, say. To, what about the cost in between? There are rent seekers standing in between the 41 naira and the 125 naira that you do not see. But it's born, has, it's born by the NNPC and not the No, 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 no. They are rent seekers. Listen again. There are people who seek rent. Before that, 41 naira eventually gets to the chap who sells it for 125 naira. They are rent seekers standing in between and, uh, and the time that it gets to that 125 naira. So these are the pictures that you do not see. You see that on the invoice, mm -hmm. it's sold to you at 41 naira. But what about the rent that you have to pay to get there? Captain Yanachok, you pay a lot of rent to a lot of people. And by the end, at the end of the day, it comes close to the 125 naira. The solution to all of these problems really is what I came down here to talk to you about last time. And I continue to tell you about it. The cheapest way for this product to get is to have a deregulated market so that market forces will determine what people pay. On the, on the very first day that you have deregulation, prices are going to spike. Isn't, then that, after some, isn't, that, isn't that why the government had to take off the uh, subsidy at the beginning of this well, year? Well, that's right, because people continue to demonstrate and they continue to scream because they wanted it back. So now they have it back. Subsidies have got to uh, be paid to the people who import these things. At the end of the day, that subsidy that's being paid is money that could have actually been used in providing infrastructure, providing a good life for the common people, but they insist that this thing cannot... Uh, so, in if, if, if they, sorry, if they take away the subsidy... What scenario will we have in the market? If they actually uh, deregulate the markets, yeah. what you would have now would be a situation where people would import products at the prevailing international market price. When I say import products, that's assuming that the refineries are not able to supply what we require. So you import the products. A lot of people will come into the market. They will import the products. They will start competing. First of all, the price might spike. And then because of the competition element, the price will start going down, going down until it comes to an equilibrium market price below which it cannot fall. And I think that people are better off if that happens because the extra money that people would have to pay would come not from the pockets of the common man, but from the pocket of the people who really enjoy the benefits of subsidy, which is the affluent in our society, people who drive cars, people who own commercial vehicles. There is absolutely no evidence to show that the benefits of subsidies actually pass from those who receive it in the filling stations to the poor people who need it. Because how many times, if you stand by the bridge and watch cars go by, and you see a lot of common people standing there, 
and people are driving only one man in his car and there's a room for four people, do, does he ever stop to give people a lift? They never do it. And with regards to the man who actually runs a uh, commercial vehicle services, when he buys his um, uh, fuel at a six, at a ninety naira, whatever it is, say they pay for it. Does he ever negotiate with the people the, um, that he carries to say, "Well, I've gotten cheap petrol, and this is your cut of a uh, but it's only, subsidy"? It's only it never those, happens. It's only those who use vehicles that benefit that use this product. I mean, it depends on the product that we're talking about. If we're talking about Both PMS, PMS and uh, carry, uh, PMS, yes, Let's yeah, PMS. It's, it's people who the people who draw subsidies in the first instance and really try and get this clear. It's the person who goes into the filling station to buy it. Not the common man who uses the transport, because there is the expectation that once you have bought it, you will pass the benefits of that cheap fuel on to him whenever he uses that transport. The proportion that is sold to people who have private cars goes to people who have private cars completely, because they have no nexus with the common man and they never give what them lifts. What about those who use this, the generating sets? Well, how many of what is the proportion of people who use generating sets? What's the volume? Who doesn't? In relation, no, you tell me now. Because is this a uh, little generating set? What is the volume in relation to the volume that is consumed by uh, road transport and all of those things? But yeah. you'd be amazed by the time you get to find out. Because no, but that's, that's an assumption that you are making. Unless you confront me with real statistics, yeah, but which shows things, the distribution, too. I would not believe that... Uh, it's the same way that we don't have statistics about the kind of vehicle, the amount of vehicles and then the amount of generating sets. We have to country, have those so. statistics, my friend. So since we, we don't can't, have we can't, we can't run this you country. Know, you know, if you've <laughs> complained about the role of the NNPC and how it is that they're sidelined in markets, as well, some people will say that the government has a duty to its people. And while all of these arguments are going on as to you know how much subsidy it really is and uh, why they're trying to determine if truly their own market is and determine how genuine their claims are they have a duty to give the people petrol they have at a duty what, to make at sure what cost well i'm sure that I, I, they couldn't they couldn't do it cheaper mm -hmm. than the private sector people even if they subsidize it and uh, say all right uh, we're going to sell this thing to you at 41 instead of the 141. Mm -hmm. Don't kid yourself and think that it's costing uh, you 41 naira. It's costing 141 naira for you to uh, buy that a uh, liter. It of could there. be an interim measure, at least to determine that truly marketers are not skimming money off us. Wouldn't that be, say, a win-win situation where the people are still getting this? have genuine claims get their money at the end of the day Mope, that is not a uh, an issue i mean i really i think that the point that you have raised is not an issue they cannot carry on forever and ever subsidizing products selling a um, petrol selling a uh, kerosene at 41 and you thinking that the cost to the economy is 41 naira it isn't it means that you get it at 41 and there's 100 naira that really ought to have been realized that the government actually has to pay to external people who supply these uh, products. So the cost of the economy is the full 141 naira. But the question that you ask yourself is, is this an efficient way to actually supply products into the economy? Mm. If you then compare the government's efforts and that of the private sector, who do you think would do it more efficiently? Because if I'm a government official and I'm there, and I can keep 100 vessels on the high seas, uh, all of them drawing a... Um, a demo rate at the rate of $22,000 a day. And because I'm a government official, I can keep them as long as possible. At the end of the day, the government pays. And there's a shortage in the money that the government could have spent on luxuries for you and I.